It's Jack together. You know what that means. Lots of games and lots of tech talk. I guess that's it. That's what we do. Boy, do we do it well. Today, the whole crew has played Animal Well. We touch on that before we talk about TJ's overseas trip, which I won't spoil here. It's fascinating. It's for a game. Uh, and that game is DayZ. And uh, they really uh, they really had some fun. Asif dives into his F-Zero resurgence. He's back. He's winning. Dominant, really. All that before we play a couple of rounds of AI, Captain. Really good pun. That's a fun one. Afterward, we head over to story time and we are jam packed here. Review Palooza Volume 2 is here. That means we have at least five, I think maybe six, Shaq News reviews that hit in the past couple days. We touch on that. EA Sports College Football 25 is here. Dead by Daylight is getting some Castlevania content. Tomb Raider is the next prestige television show hitting Prime. New PlayStation CEOs, plural, along with their forecast. Helldivers 2 is doing really well. And Square Enix announces a shift to adopt a multi-platform personality. It's about time. Of course, we wrap up the show with all of the AI discussion that we must have, thanks to many announcements from Google and OpenAI, uh, all before we touch on, of course, GME. GameStop stock, it continues to be something to watch. Asif has the beat on that, no surprise. Thanks for listening as always. I hope you enjoy the show. Here we go. This was a thread on the chatty from Rushi Max or Rush Mix Miss. I don't know how to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. Rushi Miss X. I believe Rushi you live in Cam, Ohio. Shout out. Uh, you know, I love collecting stuff and everything. Uh, I'm sure that's a typo, but I just pulled some HD DVDs out of a box and I think I can pretty safely get rid of them. Anyone still got their HD DVDs kicking around? Does anyone remember the HD DVD format? Honestly, barely. I, I want to tweak the question <laughs> just for the sake of the podcast. Like, how about sure. just straight DVDs? Or just DVDs in general? Do you have? Do you still have them? Any? I, I have an embarrassing amount of them. <laughs> I do. Uh, my brother and I had a collection when I was living down in, in Texas. Uh, so, yeah, it's still on the shelf there. Uh, but no, I don't watch them, but yeah, I have like, I don't know. I was in college at like the height of DVD, like popularity, I guess. So like there yeah. was, you know, you would buy like Mr. Show, the whole show on DVD box set or something, or like, yeah, yeah. I, I had a lot of DVDs. So I didn't, I didn't throw them away, but I, I do understand where Rushi's coming from in this thread. Like. I don't think we pulled one off the shelf in like a decade, but yeah. we do still have them. Yeah. But I, other physical media, I, I, I am still acquiring like vinyl records and stuff. And vinyl's back, huh? It's like, I don't know why it's back, but yes, it is. Uh, and it, it's like seeing, legit back. Like the, if you go into a store, like I went to FYE or something in the mall a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. there's like a legitimate vinyl section. A legitimate oh. meaning like i'm sure it's all like taylor swift that you know but like it's it took up considerable real estate in the store mm -hmm. and I, I think it's uh the younger generation is is collecting vinyl now um surprisingly but yeah vinyl is vinyl is alive and well i don't know if people really understand the virtues of analog sound versus a digital sound and i'm sure a lot of these are just digital remasters being put on <laughs> vinyl so that's you know what I mean? It's not necessarily it's the same recording process. Certainly, yeah, that's definitely what's happening. So, like, you don't have that same old-timey sound that you're going to get out of some records. Uh, obviously, there's still some uh, studios out there that are, like, actually pressing vinyls uh, when they when they release their music. But, no. I, I, just in general, the whole digital versus analog war in music is kind of over at this point. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think it's, I think it's interesting that vinyl is still around, but I know we're talking about DVDs here, but like, you know, you don't really see laser discs these days. <laughs> no, I, I do. I do have some CDs that are semi-recent purchases. I just got the final fantasy seven rebirth, like eight disc collection and I'm oh, yeah. a moron cause it's sealed and I, I don't exactly have a plan to open it. Yeah. So, you know, like shame on me. Cause like, what am I doing? Um, but there's, there's CD purchasing that's, that exists, but it does seem to be like the extravagant versions of things. Like 
I don't think you can get like a one seat, like a one disc album is pretty hard to find now. Yeah, I got a, I, I, I supported, um, this is probably two years ago, the, uh, the Nerdcore dudes. They had a concert. It was like MC Frontalot and uh, Schaefer the Dark Lord and Mega Ran. I can't remember. Some other people were probably there. And if you pre-ordered a ticket to their like live stream show, MC Frontalot would like send you a bunch of like stickers and stuff. So he sent me a signed uh, CD. So that's the most recent CD I've bought. But yeah, back in the early 2000s, Joe, like I had one of those big ass uh, Case Logic binders. Mm-hmm. You remember those? They're like bigger oh, than phone yeah. books. Oh yeah, I I still have that uh, laying around somewhere. Uh, I did take most of that music and digitize it into iTunes back in, during the Rip Mix Burn days. So <laughs> those I do days. have a lot of that stuff digitally now. But yeah, I, I was I, DVDs not as much, but CDs, yeah. And then I kind of fell off by the time Blu-rays came out. Like, I don't, I think most of the Blu-rays I own are probably PlayStation games. Yeah, Blu-ray kind of hit when, like, right when Netflix streaming hit. Yeah. And so that was never a good sign for Blu-rays. An HD DVD hit, like, what, a week before Blu-ray and no one wanted it. And of course. That's right. It was the 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 medium that uh, Microsoft adopted. Because, <laughs> you know. They got great taste. They have great taste. It was always interesting to me, the sort of agnostic description in HD DVD versus the like very IP'd Blu-ray. I would have like given the two, like I would get, I would have taken the agnostic one, but, but you couldn't find them either. They had to make a separate HD DVD player for 360. And if you want to buy one now, they're between 20 and $40 on eBay. Wow. <laughs> so... I, yeah, I don't know how else to watch them. That's the only device I, I even recall that could play them. I'm sure there was like a Panasonic HD DVD player or something, but I I don't remember. If you have an older PC, you probably you probably like don't realize that your optical port can play it. There's, there's probably people like that that don't know they. Have oh to yeah, play. like they had they had some sort of DVD R R W and it supported HD DVD and they didn't even know. I could see that De- definitely. There's that's floating around out there. Yeah, I mean I don't even have. I haven't built a computer with an optical drive in, I don't know, over 10 years. Wow, cutting edge. Yeah, you know, I'm the opposite of the cartridge family. I only have one cartridge for Nintendo Switch. Which? Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild. That's a good one. I mean, if you had to pick one. Yeah, I was more that I was worried that their servers wouldn't work the day that the Switch came out. So I just wanted to make sure I had a game at least. I think I did buy a couple others at launch and then I immediately sold them. One two Last switch. Of the, uh, I have the I have the Ring Fit cart just because like you have to buy the band for it. You can't really just buy that game digitally. And yeah, that's right. Ring Fit did very well for Nintendo. I um, still think it's pretty good. Like it's I I do not do it as much as I should have, but uh, but it, I will say that when I did do it, it was working. Mm-hmm. Remember that jump rope game that they made during the pandemic? Yes, that was pretty neat. I I kind of don't remember that. What? Yeah, there was like a Skunk Works project at Nintendo where they really, I think it was just called Jump or something. But yeah, you would use your Joy-Con and act like you had a jump rope and you would just jump and it would keep track of how many jumps you did. It was very basic, but it was fun. It was a nice, fun little, I like when Nintendo does weird stuff like that. There was also a uh, Fist of the North Star boxing uh, fitness program game, and I think it's exclusively on Nintendo Switch. Nice. But yeah, right. physical media. Phys- oh. Physical media. Amen. Yeah, I guess I guess it's here to stay, right? Yeah, I mean, vinyl has proven us all wrong, so yeah, I guess so. I don't know if, like, vinyl being around still, I don't think it means that HD DVDs should be kept. But DVDs, sure, I think people will keep their DVDs around for a while. You know, like, when your internet goes out, you can't stream. It's nice to be able to just have physical media and put it in a device and watch it. When your in-laws don't have Disney Plus, that's mm-hmm. that's the use case that that we run into pretty often. Oh, so you must have like Frozen like on DVD, just on you at all times. Yeah, well, they do, they do. Yeah, <laughs> my <laughs> my kids watch Cars one up, Cars. Yeah, I, I don't know. Do your kids like up? Uh, it's a little serious for them. 
Yeah, um, car cars is is we're in the throes of cars right now. Does the, does the boy does he like Thomas the Tank Engine? Uh, not as I mean, it's just Lightning McQueen all the way. That's good. I'm just letting yeah. you know that's good because Thomas the Train is the most expensive toy line in the universe. Well, then clearly, you're not familiar with Pixar's merchandising because we have probably 300 cars. <laughs> I'm telling it's you, insane. I'm telling you, it costs more. Uh, those trains just the 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 tracks the trains the different pieces of the trains anyway this is all physical stuff we're talking about here physical physical cars physical trains vinyl it seems like there's a future for this stuff mm-hmm. just not yeah. hd dvd basically if microsoft adopts a physical media standard you can be pretty sure it's going to fail but like you know sony the inventors of optical media probably have a good track record at this so if they do Say, hey, here's the new thing. Maybe it'll be good. But I I think we are kind of moving as a society to digital. And that's sad. But yeah, what are you going to do? Rest in peace. Yeah, RIP. Can't wait for Microsoft's next great decision. Me too. Tune in on June 12th. (laughs) Live from the Jeff Keeleys. Let's do the show. You're listening to Shack Together, a Shack News video game podcast where if you're a Knicks fan, please don't change those lucky socks. Okay. I'm a Cavs fan and I'm sad. This is Asif Khan. I'm CEO, editor in chief, and E I E I O over there at Shack News. That's extreme intel extremely intelligent, extreme intelligence officer. So that's better than A I E I E I O. And today I will soon be joined by my co-host, John Benjamin. I'm not sure if that's true, but I'm reading it. So maybe it'll happen. <laughs> Our producer, Joe Stasio is also here. Hello. And we have senior news editor, TJ Denzer, back from Europe. Hey. Hey, TJ. Welcome back to the Shack News Extended Podcast Universe, or the CPU, as the kids call it. The kids are still calling it that, right, Joe? <laughs> I think so. Yep. Nice. Uh, so yeah, TJ, we, we always ask our guests what they've been playing but also what the hell was going on in the czech like why'd you go to czech republic and prague and like were you camping like what on i was following (laughs) you on twitter for you know because you were on assignment and normally i'm like okay this person's staying at this hotel they're doing this from this time to this time you looked like you were embedded in some sort of war or something (laughs) so so what were you doing over there again (laughs) <laughs> this is uh easily the weirdest work trip I've ever taken. Like uh full disclosure since we can talk about it now, like Bohemia Interactive invited myself and uh quite a few other content creators from the Daisy community out to their headqu- their uh, offices in Czech Republic and um the I the the intention was to show off new content for the game. Uh however, there were about a f- there were a few days leading up to it where uh, we got we got to meet the developing staff. We got to uh, talk, like go to their offices and uh, and see a little behind the scenes stuff. And then uh, and then they put us on a bus and took us out to the middle of nowhere in the middle of the woods. And uh, we engaged in a Daisy themed survival camp to quote unquote earn the right to see the new content. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, and I'm talking about like the like this place that we went to. It is a decommissioned military anti aircraft base somewhere in that country. I cannot disclose where that uh, was originally built to shoot down uh, Western airplanes and uh, ballistic missiles. Uh, it's it was decommissioned. The military left it. They uh, they took all their equipment with them, but. There are still like a whole bunch of like buildings that were left up and like bunkers and then underground tunnel systems that they were using. And, and like some folks just like got this, this place and, and they built it up into kind of a scrappers commune where they literally just take junk, take whatever they get their hands on, like rusted vehicles, knickknacks, anything, and just build it up into buildings, shacks, themed like party venues and, and like stages and uh they allowed us to come out there and do this daisy survival uh thing 
among their like commune. That's wild. And it is. It's incredible. And uh, like we we uh, we we took to a shooting range with like airsoft and uh, gel soft. No, mm-hmm. no real no real bullets. Um, we uh, we learned to make fire by hand, <laughs> which um, is useful. Then, like. And then we, uh, and then we cooked food and then we engage and then eventually like we got to see like a snippet of what was coming. And then they just like took us on this thing where we had to fight like the, some of the dev team dressed up like zombies. <laughs> uh, we had to like disarm a bomb <laughs> uh, and, uh, we had to crack like a fallout style security code on a computer. And it was just absolutely ridiculous but i learned so much about the game i uh, got to meet some incredible people that were very uh welcoming daisy staff was very working very hard around the clock to make sure that everybody remained safe everybody remained had fun yeah and uh and nobody got left behind or got hurt there actually was a uh moment like where uh this one streamer the the running man z he's a he's a pretty popular day z streamer we had to go through like a, a a bunker tunnel and he like bopped his head pretty hard on the ceiling of it and scratched himself enough to like get a stitch yikes and uh but they were so quick about it like they 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 got him out of the they got him out of there they they took him to uh uh, a quick uh, office nearby. They got him stitched up, and he came back that same day. Like hmm. European healthcare, it's a thing. I wish we had it here. Yeah, even for influencers over there who bop their head, they same day service is nice. Yeah. So, but, were you camping? Like, were you in a tent? Uh, some people were. I uh, chose to sleep in the barracks, which, oh my gosh, uh, barracks from 1986, <laughs> dusty as holy hell, and. Uh, I did ask them, like, there's no asbestos in here. <laughs> I was uh, like, yeah, I, I, I couldn't be sure. But, uh, yeah, they gave us a sleeping bag, uh, a bedroll, and uh, the, we just I just kind of slept in that uh, that bunker. But So it was like a single, like, what, what kind of bed are we talking here? They literally just had, like, mattress pads, single single size mattress pads laid down on wooden pallets in the barracks. Okay, so it's not like wow. a real bed. That's like, wow. Okay, like the the loosest, the loosest depiction of what would be considered a bed. But there were uh, you could also have slept in a tent, or yes. is that? Hmm. And uh, and it was pretty comfy in the bunker as well. Like it was actually really warm in there. So some yeah. folks slept slept in the bunker on the second night. <laughs> Interesting. And wow. the bunker is actually where I did uh I mean let's go ahead and that that eventually led up to the reveal of Daisy Frostline which is going to be a huge new map for the game. It's a it's a winter themed map set on a volcanic island. Um they're going to be doing a huge update for the entire game that that upgrades fishing, brings some new clothes and stuff to the enti- to all the maps and uh really it's just like the first step of what is going to be like major new additions to day z and in, in its second decade of life yeah they're celebrating 10 years of the game this year mm-hmm. that's a, that's amazing it's cool to see that they're like not just supporting the game but like thanking their community and yeah it's just that's neat you know there's a lot of really bad stuff happening in our industry right now and seeing that is just it's just heartwarming i probably would have camped I, I like sleeping outside in like a tent i uh don't like sleeping on zero padding whatsoever. So uh, I, I roughed it with the beds, even so, though it was dusty as hell in there. Okay, because when I'm camping, I usually have a pad. It's mm-hmm. like a, it's like a not, it's not a lot, but it's like an air, like a tiny little air mattress, basically. Uh, then again, I don't know what camping in the Czech Republic and war torn, <laughs> some weird place. Yeah, I, I get that. They but, gave us a sleeping bag a piece and one of those uh, mattress pads that's kind of like a yoga mat. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. And that's so, what I was thinking. Like, when I saw those supplies, I was like, yeah, I'm going to take the barracks. Yeah, probably a smart move. It's really cool, man. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Uh, so you're like in, like you're now a DayZ player, right? Uh, yes. I have to thank Bill of for that. Like leading up to this trip, Bill wanted to go on this so bad, mm-hmm. but Bill has big back problems and shoulder problems that make it very hard for him to fly. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he came to me, asked me about this. I was like, Bill, that game is like for seriously hardcore players. And he was like, I'm going to train you. I'm going to teach you everything I know. And uh, 
that became the premise for uh, Daisy Survival School, which is our stream that we've been doing on Thursday nights with uh, Jan and Dusty. Yep, uh, it's uh, I love it. I, I love that it turned into like this month long, multi month training <laughs> session. It was uh, like the Karate Kid, but Daisy. Yeah, and Bill's <laughs> Mr. Miyagi. Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything else you want to let the folks know about this event or the uh, expansion? Uh, yeah, our interview uh, is up on the Shack News Interviews YouTube channel. It is an incredible interview with uh, Daisy Lee Tallis. Uh, we talked about not just Frostline, but we also talked about the future of Daisy past Frostline. Uh, we talked about mods and modding. We talked about how to this how that free update is going to bring value to like PC players as well as uh, console players and uh, so much more. Like a lot of that interview was inspired by my interactions with the content creators who kind of told me what their priorities were and what they wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So this really was like a Daisy community inspired interview and I'm really proud of it and I hope people enjoy it. Awesome. And yeah, it's on shacknews.com. It's uh, we have some clips of it that are going up on our social platforms too. So yeah. Give it a give it a watch when you have some time. Nice. So, what else have you been playing? Guilty Gear. The way mm-hmm. that you play uh, F Zero all the time, every time. Mm-hmm. That's the way I. That's the way I treat Guilty Gear. It's my main fighting game. I'm like planning to compete it in again at Evo, and uh, I've been training up hardcore because we're only a couple months out from that. Nice. <laughs> it's uh, it's actually like a thing where like earlier this year, uh, I was at a Tekken event and I met uh, a few colleagues that were like, we host a tournament every weekend and uh, they're pretty good players. So I've been jumping, I've, I've been throwing my hat into that tournament and uh, basically using it to kind of gauge my progress as I'm continuing to grind it out hard on some characters and be as ready as I can for when Evo comes. Nice. Uh, Joe. Yeah. What are you playing? I'm playing a video game. Yeah. Believe it or not. Nice. I'm playing I'm playing Animal Well, like the rest of the country. It feels <sighs> like. Okay. TJ already played it, but mm-hmm. he did review it, so I saw the uh I saw the review. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I mean I, I, I like it. I think that the I think that the subtext of the game and the the meta experience of the game has not revealed itself to me yet. And mm-hmm. as a result, I cannot yet be effusive on it. Yeah. Um, I've also super enjoyed seeing a variety of reviews that seem, you know, that that sort of range from like sevens out of tens, I may, maybe not in number, but in in passion, mm-hmm. to ten out of tens. And the sevens out of ten vibe ones sort of say like, yeah, it's a Metroidvania, and you see the, you get all your, uh, all your all your tricks, and you make your way through the game and then you see credits play and then there's other reviews that are like dog you didn't even play the game bro that's not the game and so it's that sentiment that kind of has its hook in me and makes me want to continue to press so that's where i'm I, at so definitely early i fired it but, up last night and uh i bounced off of it in like 10 minutes you, were, Just, you didn't like it it's not that i didn't like it it's that it's i don't know if i like metroidvanias just at all and uh the thing that I hate about Metroidvania has happened, which it happens all the time. You die and then you lose your progress because uh, the game and I get it. Some people like this. It's like it doesn't hold your hand. It doesn't tell you how to save. You just kind of stumble upon how to save. It doesn't tell you, oh, you're going to die if you hit water. It just you die when you hit water. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like little things. Um, I don't know. I, I think I might have to be in a different headspace when I play it because like I like F099. I sit down and I'm like, I know what I'm getting out of this. I fired up Animal Well and I was just like, this is, it's not bad. And I will give it another try, but I, I do think I just have a bias against Metroidvanias. And this I one is, yeah, this one is, is not so far. It hasn't got its hooks in me at all. The one thing I do like about it, uh, the pacifist nature of the game that you don't kill in the game. I like that. Um, but yeah. I don't know. It it's it seems fine, but so far it just I don't know. It didn't it didn't hit with me. As I think a lot of people. Yeah, I I do think that I do think that it isn't doing a good job of saying, "Hey, this is pretty run of the mill." Unless you put on a tinfoil hat, you know, like it's not it's not obvious. It's obviously not marketing any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that that is the case. 
Um, it is going to be a straightforward experience. And, and like you say, you're not, you're not in the bag for the genre. I am super not in the bag. I, I actually actively dislike most Metroidvania games that I play. It does not, it does whatever, you know, whatever dopamine hits for most people in that genre. I do not get it, but I am, uh, I am open-minded to discovering the murky secrets. So mm-hmm. I'll, I'll follow up anyway. That's me. Awesome. What else are you playing besides Animal Well? Yeah, so I already mentioned Animal Well. I- I'll go back to it, but yeah, I just, just from my short time playing it, I was like, oh yeah, TJ nailed it. This is an 8. <laughs> this is not a 10. I'm sorry. Sorry to everyone who gave it a 10. I just don't agree. Um. Anyway, so Ozzy was on last week, right? And he was talking about Vampire Survivors. Yes. And the Operation Guns DLC. Boy, howdy. Yes. Is that really, really good? Ozzy was dead right. And uh, it is, it's awesome. So I'm back in Vampire Survivors. And that game, you know, it gets its hooks in you for a while. Uh, so I beat I beat the uh, Galuga map, which is, uh, it's a reference, or I think it's called Neo Galuga or something, or New Galuga. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a Contra level. Uh, so all the enemies on the screen are Contra. I got one of the characters, I think his name's Bill. I don't necessarily like him because his default is a gun. And it, it's just kind of... I don't know, slow. Uh, but okay. there is a homing missile that's on the level, and that thing's really fun. Uh, nice. So yeah, there's just new characters, new weapons, new music. It's only like three bucks. Uh, so yeah, I, I played the Operation Guns DLC most of the weekend. I I still haven't beaten all of it yet because uh, you know there's like a completionist part of playing those those levels. Uh, so I haven't found everything. But yeah, really like it. Highly recommend it. And I've enjoyed it so much that I've gone from playing it on PC to playing it on my phone. So it's become my mobile game of choice these days. So nice. I'm back playing Vampire Survivors on multiple platforms. I wish that they had cross progression. I'll say that. But yeah. Go ahead, TJ. I was going to say, like, I wish that DLC had come out before I went to uh, Czech Republic because the I almost <laughs> exclusively play Vampire Survivors as a fast forward button on my life when I'm <laughs> trying to move things forward and flying is definitely one of those things. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely could have used that DLC on the nine hour flight. Mm, yeah. It's uh it's great. And uh, yeah, it's got me back playing the game on multiple platforms. Uh, yeah. Highly recommend it. And then uh, a couple nights ago, you know, I play, I play F zero 99 late at night. And I fire up my Nintendo Switch, and I fire up F-099, and it's like servers are down for maintenance. This was at like 2 in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I was like, damn it, fine. And I fired up Balatro, and I played that for like an hour and a half. So I'm back, I-, I wouldn't say I'm back playing Balatro, but it was just the game that I chose when F-099 was offline. But now, to the headline, really, of this entire show, I've been playing F-099, you guys. <laughs> Oh my god. I know it's shocking. Uh but you know, like I, I won a race however many weeks ago now, or many episodes ago. We talked about it. There was a cake delivered. I ate the cake. It was delicious. Uh here's something's happened. I okay. I might be the best F099 player on Earth again. Or I'm it on just Earth? Yeah, I might be the best. Uh Lucky. you know, something happened. I, I you know, when we talked about my troubles trying to win a race, it did feel mental or psychological more than it did skill, right? Like it was almost like self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm never going to win. So I never won, but then I won and it removed that fear that exists in you when you're playing a battle Royale of any kind. And, uh, yeah. So last night, you know, I told you guys, I'm going to be playing that middle mode instead of the 99 mode. I'm just going to play whatever is available in the special event mode. Sure. So last night I fired it up and it was team, uh, team mode. Here are my five placements in team mode. And it's different. You know, team mode is like 48 versus 48, right? So one team is green, one green, one team is pink. It doesn't really matter if you place first, but it helps your team if you do kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So here are my placements in five team races. Second, first, 84th, sixth, and fourth. First. That's a lot of top tens. That's a lot of top fives in of itself. All I'm saying is I am just, I'm deadly. I am one of the most, I'm just a ruthless player in F-099 now, and I feel like I've unlocked something. Uh, I also got a SNES badge 
you know how those those little badges on your your driver's license in the game? Mm-hmm. I unlocked an SNES badge, like the controller for playing all twelve cra- classic tracks. So yeah, the hits keep coming here, Joe. I told you I was going to be playing all the other modes, right? I like focused on ninety nine for since launch, and then I'm like, okay, now let's go to the Grand Prix. Let's go to the Mini Prix. So there's a new mode called Classic Mini Pre. This is different than Classic or just Mini Pre in general. Mini Pre is F-099 mode levels, but three of them randomly selected. Classic is that 16-bit era style game with the 4 by 3 aspect ratio, but in a Mini a mini Pre. I placed third overall in a Mini Pre. That's the highest I've ever placed in any kind of Pre. Uh, and then I went back Damn. to back. I got eighth place again. Um, played Grand Prix a couple of times. Grand Prix, I had a 24th place overall finish, so I got to all the way to the end of Night League, and then I placed 13th in a Grand Prix for the Mirror Night League. And listeners will remember my first F-099 win came on Mute City uh, Mirror, right? Uh, So yeah, that's all awesome. I love it. And uh, here are my rivals of the week. Joker, who I did not beat, Dorito Lord, who I did beat, Pekka, I just want to mention this person because they must have all the time on Earth. They added this ranking system, so if you get to 99, it restarts at 1, and then you're like 1 star, 2 star. Uh, This person has, they have done, they've ranked up to 99 twice, or sorry, three times. So they're (laughs) a 99 with 2 stars next to their name. And I was like, I've never seen anyone with that. So shout out to Pekka. Uh, Guilty Bro and also Piranha Cat Cat uh, were my rivals of the week. But yeah, I'm I am playing that game with a new sense of freedom that I think lends itself to winning. And I posted a clip in our uh, our Discord to show you guys just one of my wins last night. But because uh, if you look at that win and you look at the that's on Mute City Three uh, Mirror. If you go and you look at my win on Mute City One Mirror, it's very similar. The last lap, very. Uh, and it comes down to just, you know, kind of going balls to the walls and knowing that you can cross that finish line with zero energy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've, I've been doing that. But yeah, if you want to watch another awesome victory, watch that clip. But yeah, I'm back. He's back. I'm back, and I'm one of the deadliest racers in the known universe, so just get out of my way. <laughs> it's awesome. Though. I love that game. I don't know if you guys can tell. I love that game. Goody, it's great. Goody, goody. It's really, really good. <laughs> like... Very good. Uh, and yeah, I'm back. I'm playing it every day. Uh, it is it is a bit frustrating because uh, during the week, you don't get Grand Prix very often. There's like, it's like 10 minutes out of the hour or something. On the weekend, you get them like every 30 minutes. Uh, so I have been playing it a bit more. I will say that people that I'm, oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot to mention this. I played a couple of pro track races. I placed third on Port Town 2 twice. Uh, so these are very high placements for me, and that's the highest I've ever placed on Port Town 2, uh, which might be my favorite track in the game. Uh, but yeah, like it's the people that I'm seeing in these modes. It's like I said, the 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 casual player is playing the F-099 mode. The hardcore players are playing these other modes. So I'm encountering the same people a bunch because my rank's high or whatever. But yeah, the competition is, I would say, tougher. Uh, and then, yeah, I am pretty confident, though, that I will win a classic mini pre probably soon. And if there is a classic Grand Prix, I don't think there is. Uh, if they ever do that, I would probably be good at that, too. Because the funny part about playing classic F-099 it is, you know, how the Fire Stingray is the first, worst vehicle in 99. It's the best vehicle in classic. So it's been refreshing to have, like, the best vehicle all of a sudden again. Nice. Uh, but, yeah. Love it. I'm going to keep playing it. I highly recommend anyone else plays it, too, because a uh, very good game. And I'm going to force my staff to play it by the end of the uh, by the end of June. They will have had to play it with me on stream. But yeah, that's Sweet. what I've been playing. Uh, you're back. Safe to say. Yeah, you'll notice I didn't mention I played any Tears of the Kingdom this week. Uh, you, that did not come up. It is not in the outline. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you got you got to pick one. You got to pick one when you go that that hard. I mean, I went very hard playing Tears of the Kingdom for about two weeks there to make sure that we could have a fun stream. But yeah, I we did. I did several of your experiments, Joe. Uh, strapping a bunch of rockets to a wing didn't do shit. Uh, putting a like trying to have a carrot on like a, a stick ahead of the uh, 
the homing carts did not work. Uh, TJ saw some of my ridiculous con- contraptions succeed or fail. You did indeed try to make the uh, fire stingray at one point, I do believe. Yeah, I tried, Joe. Uh, it was too heavy, but it was okay. It just, it didn't really float. It was hard. Hmm. It's hard to make something that floats because if you make something that floats, it'll likely just take off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah, it's hard for me to. I guess it's hard for anyone to wrap the. How do you wrap your mind around the rules of the physics engine? Is uh, yeah, I'm surprised some of some of those didn't work. Mm-hmm. They tend the, to reward that crazy thinking. So one that did work, and probably my favorite one of that whole stream was when you unleashed BattleBot two on that uh on that camp of uh moblins. Oh yeah, it had the uh the silver moblin. It like had it just trapped. And it was like electrocuting him and then setting him on fire and then hitting him with it was just so funny. Uh you just like you just see me walk up to this fort, right? And I just drop my battle bot in there and it's just doing all the work. I had to maybe kill like one or two of them. And it was one of those where it shows you the monster forces health bar. You know what I mean, Joe? Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was just fun watching my battle bot destroy that. We had some fun times in the depths, you know. I, I kinda I did this thing where I flew from, you know, the Hyrule Field Chasm, the first one that you see in the game. Yeah. I flew up it from the depths to the to the overworld uh, with a with a quadcopter that I, I built because uh, it's really hard to fly straight up on the hover bike. You know, how it's always kind of tilted forward. Right, right. So it's very hard to go just vertically up. Whereas when you have four a quadcopter that all four of them are pointing upwards, it was a little bit easier. Still hard because uh, the game <laughs> it has these visual effects that when you're falling through the depths are cool, but when you're going up through them, you're like I can't see anything, <laughs> and that was annoying. But yeah, we did a couple of things for science like that. I flew from uh, like kind of east of the Heber Mountains. I flew from there all the way down to uh, the. Uh, yeah, the Gerudo Desert. So we did have a successful flight across the level. Uh, I'm fairly certain I could fly anywhere with the machine that I built. Uh, so that's pretty cool. But yeah, I'm done playing Tears of the Kingdom for a bit. Happy anniversary to the game. Shout out to Nintendo of America for spoiling the game. The ending <laughs> on, oh, on their, social, on their social media. They just spoiled the whole game. <laughs> it's You know what? It, it's only a spoiler if you know the context, right? So. I guess, yeah, I guess don't say it then. Yeah, yeah, I won't, but I'll just mention that Nintendo shared an image a year ago when the game launched that showed Link and Zelda, and they shared another image on the anniversary that showed an image of Link and Zelda, but it's literally a scene from the very end of the game. Yeah. (laughs) The very, very end, Joe. Got it. Yeah, Yeah. I I would, I would have voted, yeah, I would have voted against that one. Yes. But, you know, it's a game that's been leaked. It's a game. <laughs> there's all sorts of shit that's happened. I see people posting blatant spoilers for that game on social media all the time. Uh, and I hate it. But, uh, yeah, there's a uh, yeah. I wish more people played it. I'll just say that much. I really enjoyed that game. I enjoyed the the last third of it. I thought it was excellent. Uh, yeah. yeah. So go ahead, DJ. I've said it a couple of times, but like when you get to there's a fifth stage. And when you get to them, the game changes drastically. Yeah. And it's like, it's not even a bad game up to that point. You don't have to like suffer through dozens of hours of bad game to enjoy it. It's just that when you get to that point, the the, the training wheels like feel like they've finally come off and uh, you're unleashed onto mm-hmm. the world. And every Zelda game has that moment where you as Link, you go from being underpowered to being like a badass, right? And I think this game really did a good job of making you feel like a badass after that point. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, it's the things that they throw at you afterwards are just insane. Uh, but, yeah, love that game. But, yeah, happy to not be playing it every day uh, and doing that stupid dupe glitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they didn't patch it, <laughs> so I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that's what we've been playing. Joe, I think you have a game planned. Indeed I do. We're going to do a very short break and then dive into a fun little game. Be right back. (music) 
Welcome to AI Captain. Get it? AI uh, Captain. Uh oh. Oh no. <laughs> what is he gonna do? <laughs> In this game, it just felt, you know, like I don't know, it's the theme of the week, right? Like that that's not up for debate. It's the freaking sure. theme of the week. In this game, I will read the summary of a video game with its most descriptive pieces redacted. The games chosen that I've chosen below are games that are popularly celebrated for their enemy AI. And this is your only hint. As I read the summary for the game, you will interrupt me by saying your own name, uh, which is how you buzz in, mm -hmm. and, you, and you can give an answer. Um, you may not buzz in to answer a second time uh, until the other player has at least had their chance. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So TJ, you say TJ and I say awesome. Correct. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sounds good to you. So you have your single hint. Here we go. Game number one. Redacted is a survival horror game based on the Redacted franchise. As Redacted, daughter of Redacted, you will navigate through an increasingly volatile world. Uh, as you TJ. Yeah. Silent Hill 3. Incorrect. Ah. Did, did you finish the clue or is there more? There's a lot more. Okay, go. You'll navigate through an increasingly volatile world as you find yourself confronted on all sides by a panicked population and an unpredictable redacted. You must scavenge resources, improvise solutions, and use your wits, not just to succeed in your mission, but to simply stay alive. In addition to the main story mode, there's redacted mode, in which the player needs to escape from a specially designed map, fulfilling secondary objectives along the way, while being aggressively hunted by... Redacted. This mode includes online leaderboards. This is the end of the summary. Asif, do you have a guess? Asif, yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna get the name of this wrong. Is it is it Resident Evil? What the fuck was it called? Survive? I can't remember what it was called. It was like a mode. It was like something that shipped with an RE game that was like a multiplayer thing. I don't know. That's my guess. Incorrect. I will now reveal the publisher of the game. And you can both chime in. Sega. Awesome. Okay. The House of the Dead 2. <laughs> Incorrect. I just I thought to... this was, I thought this would be easier. Wow. I messed up. Developer. Creative Assembly. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, TJ. Yeah. Alien Isolation. Correct. TJ. Uh, good one. Wow. There's so much redacted in that. A Sega? I, I had no I idea so. that was Sega. That's wild. Am I wrong? That would no. Be, that would no, it's correct. I just, yeah. I forgot. That game, 10 years old. That game is great. And it's such like an outlier in Sega's stuff, because you don't think of them as survival horror, but that one knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, uh, get, I'm getting my grip uh, on this, I guess. You're getting your grip. And I, and I think, try and think about, try and think about the hint a little more as we move forward. Here we go. Redacted is the final game in the Redacted series. It is the sequel to Redacted released the year before and a prequel to the original Redacted. The game has a complex story with long cutscenes, but there are fewer and they are shorter compared to the earlier mentioned Redacted titles. Most of the gameplay mechanics introduced in Redacted are carried over. It is still an action game and stealth oriented, but replaces the linear corridor design from most earlier titles with large open world environments that offer the player unrestricted freedom for the approach. Awesome. Go ahead. I, I'm probably wrong. Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid 5? Correct. <laughs> okay. Nicely done. You did it. <laughs> okay. Nicely done. Hooray. Next. Redacted is a vast open world game set in Redacted a sprawling, sun-soaked metropolis struggling to stay afloat in an era of economic uncertainty and cheap reality TV. The game blends storytelling and gameplay in new ways as players repeatedly jump in and out of the lives of the game's three lead characters. Awesome. All... Oh. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto Five. Correct. Another five. Second of the three. Wow. Yeah, three, three pro protagonists. Yeah, that was it for me. That did it. Yep. Here we go. Redacted is a horror FPS that resembles a cross between Doom 3, Half-Life, and the Ring horror movies. TJ. Yep. Fear. Wow. Nicely done. I could not believe how many times this game came up when I was researching. Mm. This is... I was going to say is, Dead Space, but yeah, Fear's good. Apparent, yeah, this is now... We're looking at nearly 20 years old, and according to many Reddit posts, I don't mean even in the same thread, Fear comes up for its AI design. 
Like the, mm-hmm. the way the enemies approach you is apparently very clever. Um, but, uh, I can't speak from experience on that one, but interested next up redacted is a cooperative first-person shooter video game, the sequel to Redacted. The game builds upon cooperatively cooperatively focused gameplay and Redacted's proprietary Redacted engine, the same game engine used in the original Redacted. Set during the aftermath of an apocalyptic pandemic, Redacted focuses on four new survivors fighting against hordes of infected. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Left for Dead 2. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Good job. That game Here we go. is awesome. Another one that was is sneaky old now. Like, I mm-hmm. don't know. Yeah, was it like 13 years old now? Yeah. Well, the director Time's engine fine. is still one of the best things that has ever been made for a co-op game. Like, sort of remember that? That's what, like, designed the AI and, like, made the the encounters all random and throughout mm-hmm. the Left 4 Dead games. Sick. Like most good Valve games, it's more just a demonstration for their tech. Mm-hmm. But a good one. Good one. Here we go. Redacted is a single and multiplayer top-down party-based role-playing game with pen and paper RPG-like levels of freedom. It features turn-based combat, a strong focus on systematic gameplay, and a well-grounded narrative. That's all I have, but I will now reveal oh, the I'm gonna, PJ. It's PJ. Baldur's Gate 3, right? Incorrect. Ah. You're going to reveal the publisher? Is that what you're saying? Developer is Larian Studios. Oh, uh, awesome. Yep. Did they, is, is it Divinity Original Sin? Incorrect. <laughs> oh. Both of you guys gave answers that are technically correct, but it is not the game I chose. <laughs> so you may all, you may both buzz in at any time. I guess, TJ, just, just Divinity? Incorrect. Not the game I chose. Also, I don't um. believe multiplayer. I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. I don't know. The correct answer is Divinity Original Sin 2. Oh, come on. I knew it. I, that was going to be my last <laughs> guess if I had another game. Come on. <laughs> uh, okay. It's a different game. I, I different get game. it. Uh, I get it. But man, we were pretty close there, TJ. <laughs> you were. And that, that, was a, that, was a bad, that was a bad one. Because you, you guys were also right. With the, yeah, both of our answers were right. They were just wrong according to Joe's rules. <laughs> But if I don't hold to my rules, what, what am I? It's anarchy. Fraud. Yeah. 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 You're the AI captain now. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Redacted is a 2018 action adventure game developed and published by Redacted. The game is the third entry in the Redacted series and a prequel to the 2010 game Redacted. The story is set in a fictionalized representation of the United States in 1899 and follows the exploits of Redacted, an outlaw and member of the Redacted, who must deal with the decline of the Wild West while attempting to survive against the government forces, rival games, and other adversaries. You said it was a sequel? Awesome. I did, yep. Red Dead Redemption 2? That's correct. Now, I think... TJ is saying the third entry, and I'm also saying the third entry. That's what threw me off. Like, <laughs> let me let me quickly. Look. There is there some like tiny game we're not. Th- is it Undead Nightmare? That Undead was Nightmare yeah, considered like a f- expansion. Why was he considered the second game? Why oh, Red consider- Dead Revolver. Right. I always Whoa. forget that there was a thing before Red Dead Redemption that was yeah. technically part of that universe. Yeah, Red Dead Revolver is what you're thinking of. But whoa. It's not I the forgot. same though. Red Dead Revolver is a different game than Red Dead Redemption. Like if you're, if you're, I think your questions still sound. This was a sequel to RDR, but yeah, sure, sure, sure. Just more so that I totally forgot of the existence of this. Mm-hmm. One. Wow, good job! Austin. I know my Let- Rockstar games. I'll say that much. Clearly, a quick count is TJ with. Uh, let's see, one, two. TJ with two points. Asif with one, two, three. Four points. Nice. So TJ, I have one, two, three questions left. If you're gonna win this, you need to take back, all here. three. Yep. And I'm here we go. Cap. Put it on, because you are the AI captain now. Redacted is an action adventure game set five years after the events of Redacted. The player traverses post-apocalyptic environments such as buildings and forests to advance the story. They can use firearms, 
improvised weapons, and stealth to defend against hostile humans and cannibalistic creatures infected by a mutated strain of the redacted. TJ. TJ. The Last of Us Part 2? Yes. Nice. Correct. Correct. I was going to pick a very random game there. Which one? Hunt Showdown. Hunt Showdown. Well known for its AI? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Pretty good. Uh, wish I uh, wish I included it. Nah, or maybe this game is Hunt Showdown. <laughs> Just kidding. Next up. Two questions left. TJ, you got to take them both. Can you do it? Redacted. Redacted is a first person action video game and the sequel to Redacted. It borrows many of the gameplay elements from the first opus. Players define their own playstyle by blending action, assassination, stealth, mobility, DJ. and... Okay. Dishonored 2. He's got it. Yeah, yeah. He's got it. That was solid. Wow. All right, y'all. The final question is very challenging, but doable. There's description abound. Pay attention. And again, remember your hint. Redacted is a survival platformer set in, a, in an abandoned industrial environment ravaged by a shattered ecosystem. Bone-crushingly intense rains pound the surface, making life as we know it almost impossible. The creatures in this world hibernate most of the time, but in the few brief dry periods, they go out in search of food. What game am I describing? EJ. EJ? I want to say Risk of Rain. Is that your answer? That is going to be my answer. That is incorrect. Awesome. Awesome. I'm just guessing this. The Long Dark. Incorrect. Shout out to does it have Does it have intense rains? I don't think so. I, I mean, I have another one, but I don't think it's going to be it. Well, b- the floor is open to any buzzes. Awesome. Okay. Death Stranding. Incorrect. Okay. I will now. No, I, will, I won't reveal anything until until TJ has a chance. Guess. <laughs> Based on how this went before, TJ. Uh, Risk of Rain 2? <laughs> Incorrect. Okay, here we go. The primary publisher of this game is Adult Swim. Mm-hmm. Developer. Video Cult. Release year, 2017. You said this was first person? I did not. I will read it again. Redacted is a survival platformer set in an abandoned industrial environment ravaged by a shattered ecosystem. Bone-crushingly intense rains pound the surface making life as we know it almost impossible. The creatures in this world hibernate most of the time, but in the few brief dry periods, they go out in search of food. What was that game? I'm just going to guess another one. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Back for Blood? Not Back for Blood. Uh, a additional publisher of this game. I don't know. Ak- weird. Aku- Akupara Games is listed as a publisher of this game. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I might have to find an, another redacted game here. <laughs> yeah, this is a tough one. I, I'm i completely drawing a blank on an Adult Swim uh, survival platformer. So, I can't guess again, right? I do think uh, TJ is Yeah, I'm out of guesses. Here. It's fine. I'm going to lend my guess to Asif because I'm, con- I'm completely stumped on this one. <laughs> it's, these are bad guesses, TJ. Uh, Asif, don't starve together? Does not don't starve together. No. Okay. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. The correct answer is Rain World. Rain World? Rain World. No idea. Is... What the hell is Rain World, Joe? Rain World is also top of mind for uh, for Redditors answering this question. And again, across many threads, this is a popular answer. In fact, in fact, I should have screenshotted it, but several people were like, the answer is Rain World and there are no other answers. The best Ow. AI imaginable in this game i will give you I, another tiebreaker oh wait we're tied yeah it's four to four damn uh, oh okay the, f- the final answer redacted is the third game i'm doing this on the fly i'm doing the redacting on the fly so bear with me redacted is the third game in the redacted series it is not a direct sequel or prequel to any of the previous redacted games but takes place in an entirely different setting although it shares Similar features, gameplay, and concepts with the previous games. Redacted features a range of environments that force the player to adapt with different weapons and strategies for each situation. Interior spaces feature close combat with enemies, but unlike previous games set in Redacted, the setting of Redacted contains open spaces with emphasis on sniping and ranged combat against as many as 15 enemies at once. Mm. This game 
and get all the relative information for you. This awesome. game is published by oh, oh no, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, <I laughs> this love game to know is this. published published by Two K Games, developed by Irrational Games. Oh, uh, TJ. Oh wow, go ahead. Bioshock Infinite. We have a winner. I'm afraid, Damn. Asif. <laughs> wow, what a comeback! What a comeback, indeed. Well, was, well done, uh, TJ. Some of those were ridiculously tough. That Rain World, I've never somehow heard of rain world at all yeah it's wow. very critically acclaimed too so yeah i was surprised about that one uh, good job i played too. it a couple weeks ago actually yeah um yeah thanks uh, good job to all the players congratulations to tj for being the a sorry i have to say it with the cadence ai captain to tj <laughs> uh and uh that does it for ai captain redacted edition we're gonna head over to story time after a quick break and i'm gonna hand it over to asif goodbye Welcome to story time. Let's dive into the latest stories from the past week. And boy, we're going to hit we're going to hit these quickies, but some of them might be a little longer than the usual quickies. Uh cuz it's Review Palooza Volume 2, according to Joe. Trademark. Uh so yeah, we reviewed a lot of games in the last week here at Shack News. TJ, you reviewed Animal Well. Uh we mm-hmm. we, already, we already talked about that a little bit. Got an 8 out of 10 at Shack News. Uh and yeah, I think it's I'm going to I'm going to go back and give it a chance. Uh other reviews that we posted this week. Paper Trail is this very interesting looking uh puzzle game that's built on basically folding the world that you're playing on. So it's like top down, you're able to like put together, you know, solutions for traversing levels and stuff by folding in the right places. Wow. Uh interesting concept. Seems like it gets a little wonky at times uh, with some of the uh, gameplay mechanics. Uh, the hint system isn't great. Uh, it got a 7 out of 10 at Shaq News. Um, he he posed, what did he say? Uh, yeah, Paper Trail ends up being quite complex in a lot of ways that could be awesome for one player and super obstructive to another. I think that's pretty accurate. Like Some people like being frustrated by puzzle games and other people get violently angry. So if you're mm-hmm. someone who likes a challenging puzzle game, I think Paper Trail might be worth checking out. And I'm kind of in that category of people who like puzzle games. So uh it's it's interesting. The the folding mechanic I think is neat. And uh I don't know if it gets annoying at times or whatever. I think the key is like there you have a character whose name is Paige, by the way. Page, paper, trail, yep. get it folding. Sure. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I, I love a good pun. So having a, a pun as your protagonist's name is pretty solid. But yeah, if Paige is in the way of the fold, you're not going to be able to do it. So there's going to be like a little bit of a strategy involved in where you are on the map when you do the fold. So I think that's kind of interesting. The different meta than most pu- uh, puzzle games have. So yeah, cool. that was from Lucas White. 7 out of 10. Not a bad game. Uh, it's on Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and Series X and S. It's on PS4 and 5. It's on PC. And it's even on mobile platforms uh, via Netflix, which is now a thing wow. uh, that the people do. And a PC code uh, or was what we reviewed it on. So it's also on Steam, I want to say. But yeah, interesting game. Check it out. Cool. Next up, another puzzle game, but very different. Lorelei and the Laser Eyes. Uh, this is very intriguing. Uh, Donovan reviewed it over at Shack News. This game struck me just, it has this very uh, black and white aesthetic to it. Uh, so I, I appreciated the design. And yeah, it just seems interesting. Uh, a bunch of different puzzles. So like Paper Trail is kind of just based on that one mechanic. It seems like there's a variety of, of different puzzles. And Donovan said that if you get frustrated with a puzzle, you can just walk away and go work on something else. Uh, I think that's good because sometimes if in puzzle games, when it's just screen to screen to screen to screen or something, and you get stuck on one, you kind of just, you can get frustrated and put it down and just kind of forget about it. Uh, so I think it's important to have that kind of optionality. Uh, he said the puzzles were challenging. He liked the nonlinear design, which I just mentioned. It's got a creepy atmosphere. He said that the developers uh, recommended that you play it in uh, a dark room, and he made it maybe 10 minutes before he had to turn on the lights. So 
Wow. If you like scary uh, games, I think Lorelai and the Laser Eyes is a good one. He did say that uh, she moves kind of slowly, uh, the character on screen, and uh, the button layout was kind of weird. Uh, so yeah, those are very few negatives. Got an 8 out of 10 at Shack News, which is a very good score. Mm-hmm. No doubt. Next up, we reviewed Homeworld 3. This is a TJ review, right? Yep. So what the folks know, what you thought of Homeworld 3? It's possibly one of the best real-time strategy games I've played in years. The, uh, oh. it's, it's set in like, a, Homeworld has always done 3D space battles, but, um, they upped their game with this one by creating large, like, structures in the maps that you play in mm-hmm. that actually provide cover against a missile. You can move your strike craft behind, like, plates of space debris and that debris will eat those missiles and then you can send your strike craft in to just bombard it while it's still reloading and i think the the exit like they did a really good job with like setting up new controls modern controls and then guiding players into them and so it's kind of easy to like it's easy to segment your forces into different squads it's easy to control them and move them to where you want them to be and it's kind of easy to take part in the strategy opportunities that it gives you with that cover system. And ultimately, like, also one of the most beautiful games I've played this year. Every map was just freaking gorgeous with, like, planets in the background, stars in the background, all this debris. Just the sheer volume and chaos of uh, of different ships coming up against each other and battling it out. This was a, a very incredible game, and uh, outside of a few technical issues and uh, just the fact that real-time strategy is always kind of a tough thing for new players to get into, mm-hmm. I really loved this game. I uh, I happily gave it a 9. I uh, I really enjoyed it from top to bottom. So you mentioned in the review that the PvP options are a little slim. Like, Would you say this is definitely just a better single-player experience right now? It's not a bad multiplayer experience, but not for PvP. PvP only has like two factions, uh, and so two different options of uh, of, of specialties and ships to go through. Mm-hmm. And I felt like that's kind of where it's limited, where you could like do more with other games these days. Sure. Um, the the fun part of multiplayer is the uh, war games, which is a roguelike co op mode in which. Oh up to three players get to take command of three different cruisers or or three different carriers and you engage in randomized missions based on like it sets you off in a map and then about you're supposed to build up your forces a little bit and then it tells you this is what you have to do here's how much time you have to do it go and uh you keep going at like this gauntlet of of randomized missions until you either complete it or everyone in your squad is wiped out and I think that mode is awesome. It's it's one of the coolest approaches to real time strategy multiplayer I've seen. Yeah, because it it very much reminds me of like what if somebody built a horde mode for a real time strategy game? Yeah. Okay, that sounds cool as hell. Uh huh. Huh. Interesting. I'm gonna have to pick this game up. I haven't I haven't played it yet, but that is a uh, everything you're saying is right up my alley, man. So I'm I'm yeah. interested. I, I, I've, like I used to be very into RTS games. Uh, obviously in like the mid nineties into the early two thousands. And then I kind of fell off, but, uh, the one that has its hooks in me still to this day, I don't play it all the time or anything, but it was because it had unique options, uh, off world trading company. Yeah. That's was, a great one. I, I think it's one of the most unique RTS games made. Cause you can like, th- th- there's this whole stock market mechanic of it. So obviously I find it a little more interesting, but you can like buy out your competitors and stuff. If you have enough money, uh, you can like attack their, you can like manipulate prices of ore by attacking their ore refineries and stuff. It's just, yeah, I, I like games that that have that kind of depth to them. It seems like Homeworld Three is one of those, and it looks good and it'll run great on my ultra wide. Yeah, I'm in. Nine out of ten of Shack News. That means it's a very, very, very good video game. Yep. Uh, speaking of another nine out of ten at Shack News, uh, Lucas White. Another review from Lucas. He uh, reviewed. Read only memories, Neurodiver, uh, which is the next installment from this, the ROM series, the read only memory series. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a sequel to the 2015, 20, 2015 game called 2064 read only memories. Uh, and yeah, this is people in, who are fans of the series have been looking forward to this for like five years. Uh, so it's here. 
Uh, it seems like it's pretty good. It looks cool as hell. Like that, I like the uh, art style of these games. Uh, they're kind of uh, what are like vaporwave, synthwave kind of stuff. Yeah, it's just like just is I what I mem- what I imagine synthwave people see the world as. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, it's got some cool characters, very nice world. It nails the aesthetic image or the aesthetic mix of homage and distinct personality, which I think is tough. Uh, and it's a visual novel uh, that sticks to its guns as a medium. Uh, Lucas did say the story kind of ends abruptly, and it didn't utilize all of its interesting ideas. I never. It's it's frustrating when you when you have a bunch of like loose ends at the end of a story. Sure. Uh, and then yeah, this had some annoying puzzles uh, that could could be frustrating. Despite that, nine out of ten of Shack News, which means it's a very good video game. I need to check this one out for sure because. He described it partially as a uh, like snatcher and i freaking love snatcher mm-hmm. just a, a deep cut uh hideo kojima directed a uh, narrative adventure and this looks like it pulls a lot of like not just from snatcher but like a lot of different japanese narrative adventures back in that day mm-hmm. cool and review of Plaza was not over yet we had one more review men of war 2 uh, which is another RTS, um, but it's more like military sim. Uh, Josh Broadwell reviewed this for us. Uh, it got an eight, which is not bad at all. Uh, he praised the variations on standard RTS, uh, the excellent map design, and a, like a nice amount of different modes. Uh, he did say that the weak characters, confusing UI, and some there were some bugs and performance issues while playing it. It's a PC game, uh, so that'll happen. You know. We're in this era now where games have day one patches all the time to fix things. Uh, so yeah, looks like it's another, uh, I think this is from the company of heroes devs. So it's just kind of another take on, on that existing, uh, RTS. I'm not really a fan of like military Sims as much as I am like more like the fantasy or sci-fi stuff like Homeworld. but yeah, this looks like a competent game and it's a got an eight out of 10 at Shack news, which means. It's pretty good. Uh, that's it. We did review a Palooza. Wow, volume two. Volume two. Uh, really some bangers there. Uh, and, you know, I, I know I'm not, Animal Well hasn't landed with me yet, but it reviewed well uh, everywhere and at Shack News. TJ gave it an eight. Uh, and then, yeah, Paper Trail seems kind of up my alley, and Lorelei and the Laser Eyes seems really interesting. So, yeah. It does. Yeah, lots of different things cool. to choose from uh, in this week's reviews. Uh, so let's get to some more quickie news stories. EA Sports College Football 25 gets a July release date and also features Donovan Edwards from the University of Michigan on the cover. Uh, so yeah, we're getting a college football game. I, I don't know. If it's just a, a reskinned Madden, I'm not going to be happy. If they actually give it the love that it deserves after, what is this, 11 years without a college football game, that would be cool. Uh, but I, I'm not holding my breath because EA is doing it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens. I, I miss good college football as well. And like, I want this game to be good so badly. I really do. I am kind of ambivalent to it because I have invested so much time in my NCAA 13 dynasty where it's actually in the year 2024. That means I've played like 11 seasons in the dynasty. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. And- and I mean, you're like, you're right. Once you hear that EA is the one doing this, you just think, mm, okay, so it's going to be a monetized best pit of, uh, yeah. Like ultimate if, team cards yeah, and- if, if they even say the words ultimate team, I'm not going to buy it. I, I don't, yeah. I don't want it. I don't, I want the franchise mode equivalent. Like I want that. This is, here's what you get. This is the. This is everything we had in the year 2014, but it looks nicer. You know what I mean? But I, I don't yeah. think that's what we're going to get. The amount of freedom you had in these games with creative players, and it's just all been erased because of Ultimate Team. Mm-hmm. So I really hope that's not the case here, but we'll we have to wait and see at this point. Uh, Dead by Daylight is getting Castlevania content. Hang on, Asif. We, what? Have, a, we have a new member. Oh, my crew. God. No way. Oh yeah, fresh out of the metaverse. <laughs> Beep, bop, boop. 
<laughs> I never got how to talk like here. Yeah, beep ba boop. That's the metaverse speaking. Hi, everybody. Hi. Wow, he's yeah. back. I had this on my calendar for three forty p.m. Eastern. It's so crazy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't even have this on my calendar. This the recording time goes up and down. You know what? This is me uh, uh, blaming our fantastic uh, producer, though. Say it. Say it. I don't want to say it because you're you're really you do a I great just, job. I have to ask John. Me I don't have kids. <laughs> I don't have yeah. anything. But well, like I, I can literally record this whenever. It's yeah. That you guys. I, I am going to have you, time. <laughs> I am going to tell you. You know what? It's it's a long story. But I actually had, and this wasn't during recording time. Like then. Just calls happened and there's, you know, there's stuff. That's just life. And then my kid, for example, my my mom is there to pick up, you know, uh, my kids from the school. Um, and the one kid is there, but the other kid, where could she be? So that's my heart attack of the day, you know, like it's every time. And then she's found. No, she's found. She was found in the one, you know, the the room of the library. Like there's a study room, whatever. Anyway. 3.30 means 3.30, everybody, right? 3.30, if we're pick, if grandma's picking you up, it's 3.30. So, Asif, that's like a little glimpse of my last 10 minutes where my heart's like a little bit racing. No, get it. Yeah. But like, I, but, I, I could pick any hour of the day and some something would happen to prevent you from being up. The best hour is probably 10.30 p.m. <laughs> When I'm I'm settling in to watch the Knicks game on a 90 minute two hour tape delay, I can't even look at my phone because I don't want to be spoiled. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, I had lunch with um, a former colleague of ours who's going to be reaching out to you soon. I don't know if I should spoil it, but it was an impromptu. Okay, awesome. It was a pro- it was a blast from the past, and this the reason that I'm bringing this up. This is actually tied to. Nintendo, or should I be more specific and say it's tied to Endo? Oh, ah, nice hint for the one listener. And I'm talking to Asif <laughs> right yeah, now, who I, I would get even, that reference. Yeah, maybe Adam would listen to this episode and he would know. <laughs> Adam, Adam would know, yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, Mr. Uh, uh, Michael uh, Veroni, uh, oh. who was the co creator of. Nintendo box back in the day, one of the first websites that we ever worked on, which mm-hmm. was just an N64 slash GameCube like love letter. And it yeah. was gorgeous. It was awesome. Maybe like, the best logo ever. Best um, logo. It was so fun. It was hey, kind of on. the inspiration for all this <laughs> Sorry, stuff. Jeff. Yeah. I mean, this is like I will say, the- Mikey, he yeah. designed the man with the briefcase logo, the productive citizen logo. Yeah. That's the artist. It's a great logo. Before copyright infringement was a thing, he designed the motion graphic for my first company where the backing track was a Dr. Dre uh, <laughs> instrumental. Where I was like, this is just a gorgeous instrumental. Can we do it? Back before we thought this would be a problem and just for fun. But anyway, it was nice. And that's tied to Tendo. Hence, I'm bringing it up on the podcast. This nice. is why I don't show up too often to the podcast. I have very little to offer. Well, I'm I'm happy that Mikey's doing well, and he was in Jersey at least for a, that's his homeland. He went back to the homeland uh, for, a for a little bit. bit. Nice. Yeah. Well, you yeah. caught us in the middle of quickies, so uh, well, yeah. That was a quickie. There you go. <laughs> There's your quickie. Well, I look forward to hearing from Mikey. He's great. Uh, yeah, is he still yeah. is he still down in Austin? He is working at a uh, yeah at a studio. Uh, nice. That I don't want to. Yeah. I don't know if I'm no, able no. to say anything. Yeah. So no, no, no. Anyway, he, he's, he's been, great artist. Like I said, he designed a lot of John's early websites, but he also made the Productive Citizen logo, and he made an Army of Techno logo. He made one of my album covers. Yeah, he's awesome. He's a beast. And um, Joe, I heard you just about a couple minutes ago before we went into this love letter, um, to to Mikey. Um, the the best logo. At the time, okay? And then the Moonrock logo came out. <laughs> I mean the best logo in that era. That That's era. Guys, yeah. it's That's no, <laughs> let's just let's do some damage control. I already <laughs> shit on Joe for the lack of a calendar in right. I, yeah, I don't know. I have a yeah, he probably calendar said, by the way, that he probably said, and I just, because I'm oh, an asshole. I, I definitely sent it, yeah. yeah did I, you I, have I just, one? I have one. 
I had one. So yeah, I don't know. Telling you, I know we can I figure mean, it out. Like if if I needed no, some no, smoke no, signals, I'm or... telling you what it is. It's I I'm I'm an asshole. I don't <laughs> I'm bad with you know organization. So us, if that's the uh, it's all good. Don't worry about it. Is. But yeah, let's let's keep these the quickies going. Quickies, uh, come on, quick it up. Dead these by Daylight quickies, is really getting telling? Castlevania content later this year. Uh, so. Good on Konami for like remembering that they have IP that people are interested in and they're doing stuff with it. Uh, because I, I talked about it earlier, John, but Operation Guns for Vampire Survivors is awesome. It's like the Contra DLC for that game. Uh, and yeah, now we're getting Castlevania D- DLC and Dead by Daylight. Dead awesome. by Daylight just keeps going, like, keeps just, yeah, man, yeah. like, this is on top of the fact that we're like they just confirmed and showed off uh, Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> content. They have uh, two more licensed chapters that are happening at some point in the next year, and uh, they have some a couple chapters of original content as well. So, like all this stuff and Castlevania, like Dead by Daylight is. I said it earlier on Twitter. It's it's like the Fortnite of horror now. <laughs> it really is. Like they they have yeah. so many crossovers with so many iconic horror franchises. Like Chucky, how did they make Chucky work? They did. Yeah, they, I, that, that was surprising. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, want to move on because these are quickies. Amazon announces a new Tomb Raider Prime video series uh, from Phoebe Waller-Bridge. I just want to point out that the logo for this looks like shit. <laughs> it, looks, <laughs> it looks like an HDMI port logo or something. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> it does, yeah. This is um <laughs> like what what on earth am I even looking at there? <laughs> but yeah, good on Bezos for green Bezos greenlit this, but he couldn't give us season two of the tick. He had to cancel the tick, and I will bring that up whenever we talk about Amazon Prime Video. Well, um, funny enough, <laughs> one of the producers of that is uh somebody we work with pretty closely, but um, yeah, they're the ones who make the Tomb Raider sort of made that. that well, sort let of them know that logo's ass. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, hey, hey, this is where we're supposed to try to come in. Hey, you heard it here, buddy. We told you we could help you on the on the visuals. On the <laughs> this is a terrible logo. Come on, Nothing Bezos. about this is Tomb Raider to me. It looks like just uh, it, it, it looks hey. like a, yeah. It looks like a step above Microsoft Word art. <laughs> It, it is like that word when word art became 3D as well, right? Mm-hmm. It's like that yeah. one step above. Um, for the content of it, for the content of it, BB Waller Bridges was in um, Indiana Jones, right? Mm-hmm. I thought the Indiana Jones movie was fine. It wasn't amazing. It wasn't terrible. I actually think she's a pretty awesome writer. When you know she. Like Fleabag was awesome. I don't know, you know, what else? Uh, that was an Amazon series that was pretty, pretty great. But um, do we f- have high hopes for this one? No. Like, no. Oh, really? What, what, what's the consensus? Is it like this looks I, like she's the wrong fit for this, or what's what's the deal here? I just don't have much faith in the format. Like, I don't think Tomb Raider lends itself to a series. I think it's better as a film, right? Because then you can just like focus on one story. Like, I don't know. Is this an origin story for Laura Croft? Like, are we going to have a whole season where we learn who she is? Or like, there's a lot of questions still, but I just think my main concern is that we've seen Tomb Raider adapted before to film and it wasn't terrible. I don't know if a show is the right way to go with this. That's all I'm saying. Uh, And that is ass. It's fair enough. But like, then you see Uncharted was just a not that I did not even watch the film. Uncharted 2 is one of my favorite games of all time. Mm hmm. Top 10, I would say. But, like, I did not even watch the movie because it just felt so... Maybe that was just not great, not great casting. I, I don't know what it was. Sometimes um, they're just rushing stuff out the door, too. I think that that was... A, yeah. Wasn't that a movie that, like, it got delayed by COVID and stuff? So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe maybe some things that they were working on just never came to fruition. I think when they originally greenlit it, it was going to be, like, Marky Mark was Nathan Drake, but by the time they actually filmed it, he was Sully. That's funny. Yeah, that's, like right. It took, that's right. It took that long <laughs> to produce it. Uh, so I think that's part of part of the problem there. Uh, does yeah. not look like a Sully. No, he doesn't. But I don't think they cared at that point. It's, it's kind of like no, clear celebrity. And there probably was a contract where he's like, you have to put me in this film. 
or else you give me money and I do nothing. Uh, moving on, Xbox, Microsoft found a way to do something that's actually useful this week. How about that? Uh, wow. They're working on a controller with BioWave uh, that's like this modular accessibility controller that you can like create uh, a bunch of single grip uh, controller uh, configurations. Uh, so it's got like two pieces of a power cube, one charge spacer, an analog cube for left and right so that you can put your analog sticks wherever you want. Uh, I just think it's cool as hell. Uh, I do like that Microsoft still is working on accessibility products. And yeah, I think one-handed gameplay is important for accessibility, especially in like a console environment. So yeah, shout out to Xbox and BioWave uh, for working on that. You know what's always a bad sign for a company? When they have two CEOs. And that's what Sony just announced uh, right before their earnings. Hellman, Hel Herman Holst and Hideaki Nishino will replace Jim Ryan as the interactive entertainment Sony co-CEOs. Uh, so Holtz is now going to be the CEO of the new studio business group, which will oversee PlayStation first party titles. And Nishino will act as CEO of the platform business group, which will oversee hardware, technology and accessories. Uh, as well as PlayStation Network and third-party relations. So it does sound like they're taking the Jim Ryan role and splitting it into two roles, uh, but I don't think that's really... Was it Activision that did that, like, two years ago? Yeah, they double did. Double CEO? Mm -hmm. They did a double CEO, Activision did? It might I have been, like, so. a single CEO, because it was still Kotick, but then they had, like, multiple presidents or something stupid. Two presidents. It was two presidents. Yeah. That but, should work. That's, yeah, it, you it, know what? That's maybe the solution... Do this this election year? No, two no. presidents. Come on, no, double it up. No, get them together. Come on, hey buddies, they both suck. Sorry, not to uh, be yeah, political. But like, uh, look, <laughs> two negatives make a positive. I think I, uh, isn't that a thing? Is that I just magnet? So. It's no, just I, no, that's I not magnet. It, I think it's everything. Okay, well, Joe got I think it. It's just I think it's just the way things work. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. moving on. I'm not going to talk about the president here. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get him on. I'm trying to. Get, you you know what you're doing it's right now, and I'm trying to not do that. It's true. It's I want to talk about how Sony forecasted a two percent decline in revenue for their gaming division. They Don't are, they are not doing great over there, man. They have like no first party titles coming out at all. That's, that's what I was going to say. I think I have the solution to that. Make games. He, you took the words out of my mouth. There you go. <laughs> no, that's it. Make games i mean even stellar blade i'm like it's kind of a mid game right it's i think it's fine it's a fine game animal the biggest, is crushing it but like stellar blade is fine but like the biggest playstation that, release of this year is a third party game called final fantasy rebirth final fantasy 7 rebirth that's the big first part that's not first party but that's the big game on their system this year but even the first best the biggest first party game over the last 12 months what what is that spider-man Spider Spider yeah, Spider yeah. Spider yeah. And Spider Man mm -hmm. is, is Spider Man aging well? Is this aging well? Okay, I'm sorry. This is not quickie. This is quickie. We <laughs> no, we're this. we're entering the longy portion. Uh, you know, so I just I want to mention the restructuring of the leadership, but also their forecast is not great, uh, and hardware is a, a large part of that. The the hardware, it seems that the PlayStation Five cycle may have peaked already when it comes to demand for the console. Uh, so we're gonna see. It, they've sold like 59 million units life to date. And it's what we're entering year four of the system's life. Usually uh, you would have a lot of games coming out at this point in the life cycle of a console. So it's just very mm -hmm. strange uh, what's going on over there. And I wonder if it's just kind of like they're taking the L on this generation. Uh, another data point that came out, PlayStation Network, which we all know everyone loves, especially on PC, uh, had 118 million monthly active users at the end of Q4. Here's what's interesting. 60% of those people, they're not on PlayStation 5. They're on PS4. Mm, that's so, so fun. People are still playing games on PS4. Wow. Uh, yeah, and online games are still on PS4. I'm sure a large majority of those people might just be playing Fortnite or something. Uh, but yeah, there is uh, still sizable amount of people playing playstation games on their network i do think it's interesting that they're trying to shift things away from here's our console sales to here here's our recurring revenue network because it's over because it's over console sales no longer exist that's it we're post console we really are i mean xbox the decimation of xbox i know it was a slow <laughs> roll but 
It happened oh, within two weeks. Xbox oh, is man. no longer a thing. You're not right. You're out PS5. of pocket. PS5 <laughs> is, yeah, everybody's clamoring for a PS5. Nobody's clamoring for a PS5 anymore. We're you know what they're clamoring for? Which is That's a console. I know that we're post multi console. Let me put it that I way. I think what you want to say, and we're it done. may be hard to say, but what you want to say, I think deep down you know this Nintendo won. Uh, I don't know. Uh, look, by the way, first of all, yes, I would love to say Nintendo <laughs> won because you know, <laughs> they won. had a lunch where half the fucking conversation was Nintendo this and that. Nintendo won. They won. The, the philosophy has they won. won. That's they won. what I mean by post console yeah now if it won. can be backed up by the share price going through the roof let's go baby uh, or or i'm sorry uh, that it takes 20 million sorry i'm sorry it takes 20 years to become a millionaire in nintendo i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry that you, all you have to do okay. is nothing just okay. hold it for 20 <laughs> years and come back and be like, hey Asif was right I or, by the way Asif, you would have been very happy at this lunch again <laughs> because we sang your praises i'm not even kidding i should even tell you this because like you'll be like you know. <laughs> Like, you know, I Just, hear that you're the, talking about you're talking about the portfolio that I built for both of you guys. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty yeah. good. It was, it was fantastic. Good. It was it might be it, it might be the best portfolio ever created. But you know, and we whatever. talked about Nintendo. I was yeah. like, you know, and I said also GameStop. Even anyway, okay, quickies. We're in quickies. I'm sorry. Sorry, you know, Nintendo. When I first recommended it, was trading below three dollars a share, and now it's at thirteen. So it's not like the worst return ever. But you know, no. whatever. Quickies, quickies. All I'm saying is that at a time where PlayStation is struggling and Xbox is struggling, Nintendo is investing and hiring people to make more games. And we might actually see a 4K Mario game. We oh, might I actually see it. I do want that. Yeah. Uh, also, my mind. more Sony news because we love Sony news. Helldivers 2 has sold 12 million copies since release. That's another success story, but that's not a first party success story, right? Uh, we is Helldivers 2 not first party? It, it's like no like second party is not, yeah it's arrowhead by... studios i think made the game uh yeah. but yeah it's like stellar blade it's like a third party studio and a first party publishing deal mm -hmm. i thought yeah uh, yes. i think that's the best way to describe it uh and then we kind of this kind of piggybacks on what we were talking about with sony square enix announced a shift to a, an aggressive multi-platform strategy because they were disappointed in the sales of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. So this whole platform exclusivity thing didn't really work out for them with FF7 Rebirth uh, as it was a PS5 yeah. exclusive. They did a console release in a post-console world, baby. I just yeah. brought it back. I'm going to... He's coined it. He's coined it. It's post-console, except if you're Nintendo who is selling consoles like it's their job. I'll say post-consoles. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify then. Post-consoles. So... Is there not a PS6 coming? I, I would be very surprised. I wouldn't be. Well, I'd be very surprised if there's a new Xbox, of course. I don't think that. I think that's done, right? But like, as far as the PS6, I wouldn't be surprised if they just go again post console. <laughs> no. And I think GameStop this is the is, way. Yeah. GameStop's down 30% on the day. All right. Um, yeah, let's move on to the longies. Google IO 2024, they announced like 50 different AI projects. And I don't know how many of them are going to see the light of day. The one thing they didn't say is how much it'll cost the customer for any of it. Uh, so that was weird. But weirder was Mark Rebier, Loop Daddy, opened the event. Have you ever seen a, a musician open a, a keynote for Google? No. Uh, I don't remember. But I liked seeing Mark and him with his Google robe, like doing his dancing and then taking off the robe only to show another, another Google robe. robe. Yeah. He, I like him. I don't know if this was, this you is know, not on brand. What were your thoughts? Yeah. This I was, that's the thing. I, I it hate was this. Not, yeah, yeah. I love Mark. Want to support him in everything he does. He is the champion of home studio musicians. And that's all about improv being born out of his brain. So for him, yeah. for that guy who oozes creativity, for him to endorse AI, music i found it gross and his fans did too if you go look at his youtube channel he posted one of his google loops which he called a gloop and uh the fans hated it uh so yeah people are like get your bag mark but we're not happy about this so i kind of feel the same way it's like get your bag mark i, I wonder how much they paid him i'm thinking it's got to be seven figures 
to endorse I'd be AI. Shocked if it was seven, I don't think so. I don't think you he's think going six? that kind of way. I do. Come on. I. I mean, he's awesome. I. I. I you were on. On Jesus, this is the kiss Asif's ass hour here. Uh, but you're just on once again. That. I was early. I was early. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, no. I hey, tend to be let early. Somebody else just sing your praises. Don't sing your own praises. I'll, I'll sing your praises. No, you, you. You honestly like. No, you called it with Mark. I really. I mean, we were. Shaq News had the party with mm-hmm. Mark Rebier years before anybody gave a shit. Yeah, about 2019. Mark. Yeah, no one cared. <laughs> no, no offense to Mark. He was <laughs> no, he just wasn't <laughs> as popular <laughs> then. You know, he now he's popular. In, now everybody's he's yeah, in movies he's in and football. stuff. He's like he's all over the place. Uh, yeah. he's in he's in advertisements in Germany for like grocery stores. Like I've seen him everywhere. I'm not mad at him for getting money. I I'm very yeah. happy he's succeeded. But this is one of those moments. He's been getting dragged on Twitter for several days now because they're like, this is what peak AI looks like, and this is cringe Google, and it's kind of true. I, I mean, it, it, two things came to mind. Yeah, it's like, Mar- I'm happy for Mark, but this seems off-brand, like you said. And number two, now he's probably prohibitively expensive because yeah. now all the goddamn Silicon Valley people will want it him did, for their it, fucking company. It felt like a Silicon Valley episode. It really did. The whole thing. I was like, okay, that's awkward. And then they, Google, at the end of the press conference, or whatever you want to call it, they're like, we said AI 119 times during this presentation. It's like, God, I don't care. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And uh, yeah, it didn't seem, nothing seemed too bad from the actual event. Like they they showed some computer vision demos, uh, some other uh, voice translation stuff, like the stuff that we've been seeing from them for years, just now all branded with Gemini. So the question is, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I thought it was the end of the world, though. Like, I thought this was the Google search thing. The fact that, like, SEO, maybe you were going to talk about this, but the SEO being so, you know, dinged over the last 12 to 24 months. And now this is just the deletion of whole industries. Like, mm-hmm. Google's like, no, we're not about elevating, you know, websites and publications and information. We're about just taking that information and displaying it on our site because we can monetize it. This is Google. It's not like, what was their old motto? Like, don't, don't do be evil. evil. Don't be evil. Yeah, don't be evil. This is Google actively being evil. Like, it's not the absence of a negative anymore. Mm-hmm. It, we're actually being evil. And I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm surprised at how, I think societally, Joe and I were talking about this, I think, yesterday. This is a this is a big issue. This is going to really hurt a lot of people and a lot of companies. And eventually, also something that I think you said or we've talked about. Yeah, AI can't learn from AI. And once all these companies and publications and writers are, you know, ha- struggling and having a problem like getting their wording out, and and you know, uh, wh- what's going to happen? The, Google's not playing the long game here, are they? Like eventually, the 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 source of content it dries up. And now we're just a dumber, shittier society. I think we hit peak intelligence like last year. So like, w- where are we <laughs> headed? You know, it's going to be computers talking to computers. So, so I thought the I Google wanna, thing was terrible, man. Yeah. I, um, Regarding search, yeah, it's not good. It hasn't been good for a while. Uh, we haven't really talked about it directly here. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, Google search has gotten worse. The prioritization of Reddit over actual websites is stupid. Or Quora over actual websites is dumb. Uh, They're also going through and individually nerfing websites based on the content that they see on their pages. So a lot of our competitors are putting up negative 60% year over year numbers for page views. That's brutal, especially when everyone's running ads on those pages and that's how you pay your people is through ad revenue. You have 60% less ad revenue now than you did a year ago. Uh, So yeah, we'll get to that. I want to hit this open AI news. They showed off GPT-4 Omni this week. Uh, it can interpret audio, video, and text in real time, and it can kind of hit on you. It sounds like the voice of the AI in the movie, Her. Uh, so people were like sexualizing the AI already. We don't even have a robot to have sex with yet, but we'll get there. Uh, so yeah, they showed off a ton of cringy demos. You can see them on our social feeds. Uh, but then I think it was two nights ago, OpenAI chief scientist Ilya Sutskever uh, is leaving the company. <clears throat> and it's not just Ilya. Uh, there's been about 30 high up people who have left OpenAI in the last week. Um, not entirely sure what's going on there. 
I have seen some interviews in recent weeks, and this is when everyone's like, oh, AI's here and it's going to take over the world. Your point about training, John, it's not just about what we're using to train it. It's how much power is required to train these things. Like these new data centers they want to spin up, you're going to have to get a power plant to power it because there's not enough power on the American grid right now to spin up these large language model computer vision neural nets. There's just not enough energy to spin up the so big computer. You've seen the matrix. So yeah. what is the power source? The humans? <laughs> there yeah. <you> go. <laughs> no, I, I, I know the dystopian answer here, but the realistic answer here is I think American AI companies are about to hit a constraint, not on compute, but on the power required for the compute. That's what I think is interesting, is that there, the AI trend, the singularity that seems all but certain, we may, may not be able to hit it because of energy constraints. And you know what country doesn't give a damn about spinning up nuclear plants? They'll do it in like a week. China. So I have a feeling that China may have a more advanced AGI than us in about five years. Because uh, I, I think we're seeing a, it, it's not unlike what we saw with Bitcoin where the compute used and the amount of electricity used makes certain things unviable. And uh, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman even said, we could spend $50 billion a year for all I care. As long as we get to AGI, that's all that matters. I'm pretty sure his shareholders and Microsoft would like to make money off of this stuff. And I have not seen anyone show, even Google, in, in that case, John, has anyone shown that AI isn't going to be tremendously deflationary for the broader economy? No. And they haven't explained how much it's going to cost uh, to the user either. So it's just, I don't know. I think before everyone drops everything they're doing to go all in on AI, I think there are some constraints you need to consider. I think it's, it's a great point, the power constraint. And then I, I think what I was making before is like the information constraint mm -hmm. is going to be there soon enough. Mm -hmm. but I, I think like the fact, I mean, the idea that AI is <clears throat> going to take over um, you know, I mean, we were supposed to have self-driving cars by now, right? And cities on Mars, you know, in 30 years and all this shit. Let's see what happens. I think it's a very critical couple of years. And I hope, you know, society and people just continue to be pretty, you know, anti this because it's going to, it's costing jobs. It's costing companies. I'm not being, a, a, you know, sweet about it. Like this fucking sucks for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So like there's such a cascading effect that, where, where, where are we going with this? So I think it's going to actually have to work itself out societally where you have the power issue. How do you solve that? You know, and then you have the information issue. How do you solve that? Have we gone a little bit too far with this? And you're saying the dystopian thing is the human power source. What if that's the realistic one? Anyway, I'm going to leave it. Leave no, it there, I, fellas. What no, is the realistic? I, what is we are the power? We are the battery. I, I think that you only get to that scenario when AI has control of like a 3D printer or something. Um, but yeah, there are, I, I think it's troubling that once again, something has happened at OpenAI in the last week where a bunch of very high ranking people are leaving. So something's going on over there. We don't know what. It's kind of been a black box. One last longy before we hit the road. One of my favorites. Uh, GameStop shares surge following the return of Roaring Kitty to Twitter. Keith Gill also known as Deep Fucking Value on Reddit. Uh, he was the poster child of the short squeeze in 2021. Uh, he was even featured in that Dumb Money movie, right? He was a character in that film. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do we really think the stock went up because this guy came back? That's a question I would ask you. Yeah. I don't. I'd say yes. <laughs> I'd say, like, I don't. Why, what was the catalyst? And are we say, are you saying it's like a coincidence? The guy came back and holy shit, we popped, you know, 60%, whatever it was. Well, um, first of all, the stock, the stock had been rallying for a week before he came back. It was just to give people a frame of reference. The low of this month was $10 and 70 cents on May 1st. It went to on Friday last week, Friday the 10th. It, it hit a high of 20.2. So it was up 100% in a week before dude even showed up, right? Yeah. And we went we went from, in April, average volume, you're talking maybe 3 million shares a day, right? That week I'm talking about, it started going to 36 million shares a day, then 48, then 24, then 50. Then Keith tweets on Sunday night, and the stock 
traded 182 million shares on Monday and then another 204 million shares on Tuesday. Mind you, that's 100 times the volume from a month ago. And 200 million shares at $40, you know who can't afford that? I don't know, everyone on earth? Who do you, who's buying this? Who do we think is actually buying this crap? Do we think it's actually retail investors that spent $8 billion buying stock this week? No, definitely not. So what's going on? This, If you believe the short interest, it's at 27%. That means one out of three essentially shares are being shorted. And I, we've reported on this. One out of three shares at GameStop have been directly registered with computer share. There's about 190,000 people who own about 30% of the company, and they've already registered it. And then you have the in insiders that own nearly 20% of the company. My point is there's not enough shares to go around. And that's what happened earlier this week. Now they halted it. They've halted GameStop more this week than I think I've seen any company in the history of the world. Uh, so no, I think the squeeze was going on. Keith added to it with his tweets and he still is. He's tweeting every 15 minutes basically. Uh, but yeah, if this was just Roaring Kitty, wouldn't the stock still be going higher? Uh, it peaked a couple of days ago at 64. So you're talking about a stock that was $10 at the beginning of the month. It went as high as $80 in the pre-market on Tuesday before they just started slamming us with halts. All, so, all so my I point know. is that this is a short, yeah. this is a short squeeze. This has very little to do with DFV. He might, there might be a reason that he's back, that he, he is talking about GameStop again. That's interesting yeah. to me. Like, why is he back? That's he the question. never said why he left in the first place, and a lot of people speculated that he may have been under a gag order after his uh, his time speaking in Congress. So my oh, my, I would suggest he might know something that we don't. You know, one 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 really weird anecdote. Um, I'm not a content creator, but I have a TikTok account. There was an experiment I did where I was like, I'm going to post a piece of content every day for a month, and let me see what this is. That was during the first run up where he did he was in front of congress and i just took a little clip subtitled it and i was like this is an interesting thing you know i am not a cat that's that that was the line right that was the quote mm -hmm. and it's a it was actually very astute you know you should definitely look at it um i've i logged into tiktok for the first time in quite a while uh yesterday and i saw a shit ton of notifications and i'm like what the heck like what happened? And that video is back, baby. <laughs> like people like commenting, like, "Hey, GME, you know, to the moon, blah blah blah." I, that is completely anecdotal, completely, you know, silly, I guess. But I think that is like a little bit of a barometer where he does have some impact. And like no, he is talking talking about it. I think not just because of the rally. I think him coming in, maybe that's just a good story. But I, I see like people are. I think he does amp people up. Um, that's why his memes are all like movie clips and stuff like that. It feels like like he knows what he's doing. I think he's just feeding into it. You might. I think you have a point. It's like maybe this was not him leading the charge, but him now participating in the charge one week into the charge. That's my and like point. amping it. That's that I see for sure. I, I actually that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but he's feeding he's feeding the beast a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I think that he saw what was happening and, but also let's say he was in a gag order. Let's say that there was some sort of SEC investigation going on that he was a part of, right? I think his actions this week imply that he was found not guilty of any wrongdoing and now he can go back to posting his memes. Uh, I also think there's an element of revenge for every GameStop shareholder because we got screwed over on January 28th, 2021 and we want we want all of the money back, if not more. Uh, the other thing going on is there was a technical breakout in the stock on the yearly chart, and it actually just broke back below that number. So the number to watch in GameStop right now, folks, is $27.65. Above that, there is an active buy signal on the year. Below that, there is not. So we're sitting at twenty-seven twenty-eight right now after hours. Uh, so there is like a technical reason on the chart while this why this is happening. There's a fundamental reason because the company's profitable and the borrowing cost shot up to 25% annual interest uh, on Tuesday. So this is my point is that there's something institutional going on here. The sheer amount of money flowing in and out of GameStop, it's impossible for this to be 
uh, retail investors. We don't have that much money. We're talking like four billion, eight billion, another five billion yeah. and, in, in in three days. We don't have that money. And maybe that's where he's coming in to get the retail investor interested again for like a some 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 more oomph to that the rally, knowing that maybe it is institutional investors and knowing that to really make this thing pop, you need the retail investors. Maybe it's just that kind of strategy. Maybe he's just playing the game. He could just maybe be he's having just fun. Playing. He that's what I'm just, saying. I, like yeah. maybe he's just fucking around with the market, which I think is pretty interesting. You know, but that's what led. That's what led people to go into GameStop the first time around. It's like, hey, let's. This is all fake. This is all not fake, but this is all. It's a bullshit sort of market for a lot of people. Let's fuck with it, everybody. And well, let's show I, I just. I, I want to, I disagree in one sense, because like, if you go back and you watch his videos from 2020, he lays out a fundamental uh, investment no, no, thesis. No, no. Yeah, no, you're right. I'm not saying him. I'm saying that the people who followed him, some of them absolutely with the fundamentals. I think it became a cultural moment, though, where people wanted to fuck with the market. And they I, got I really dumb, of, though, John, like no, a lot of them were like, I'm going to buy Blackberry. Blackberry. I'm going to yeah. buy I'm going to buy Nokia. It's like, no, 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 guys. Go buy the one stock that this is about. And yeah. like, we saw yeah. what happened with Bed Bath & Beyond. Those people got carried out on stretchers. We saw what happened with AMC this week. What did that guy do again? He they issued totally more shares. More money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He issued He's... more shares again. He has diluted yeah. those, those shareholders. You know, this is a, I think this is an important thing to point out. AMC peaked at 726 a share. Uh, in 2021, right? It's currently at four dollars and sixty eight cents. So it's down in that time period. It's down ninety nine percent AMC stock since the first squeeze to now. GameStop, on the other hand, peaked at one hundred twenty a share and is currently trading for twenty seven. So like you're talking it just like that one. Time. I thought it went to like three hundred, four hundred. This is a split. It's split happened, adjusted. There was right, a four. Okay, there was a four bad. for one yeah, split. Yeah. So yeah, right gotcha. now GameStop is down seventy seven percent. But earlier this week, it was down like fifty percent from its all time high. My point well, is that one company, like, yeah. one company actually is in the midst of a turnaround. The others are just being labeled meme stocks. And if you say meme stocks around me, I get violently angry because yes. Some people YOLO'd into bullshit stocks just to take yeah. advantage of it. Other people, myself included, who's been writing about GameStop since freaking 2010, we knew that this was a problem. It was like the, the worst kept secret on Wall Street was that the, the short interest at GameStop was over 100%, which was illegal and dumb. Uh, but short sellers are not necessarily smart. They get these egos to them. And if you didn't cover it $10, you should, you should have. Now it's at 27. You are now like you've lost a good chunk of your money if you're short the stock right now. Yeah. Um, so I just think it's very different. One company issued shares, paid off their debt, and is no longer, you know, doesn't have a going concern. And AMC is like two years away from bankruptcy. And I saw all these people pile into AMC. You know what? You know what Keith has not tweeted about once? AMC. It's all GameStop. Every single thing he has ever said since he returned was about GameStop. And everyone likes to take what he's saying and, oh, it's about this, it's about that. No, he's he literally only has one stock. And I think tomorrow night, the best thing that could happen for everyone is if he posts his Reddit YOLO update. If he's like, here's my portfolio today. I doubt he does it because yeah. he does seem to be skirting around the SEC right now. And he's like thumbing his nose at the SEC almost. Uh, so he probably won't do that because I think that's what got him in trouble more than the memes. But yeah, I think this is a fascinating story. I've said it for years. I know that I've been long the stock this whole time. And as just someone who has watched this stock, I don't think this is over uh, by a long shot. And I think he might know something we don't because of the regulatory scrutiny that he was put under. You know what I mean? Like he he may know something we don't. Uh, and maybe it'll come out at the shareholder meeting in June. Maybe he's going to join the board or something. Like maybe he's going to be like CFO of the company. Who knows? But I, I think uh, it's interesting that he's back. I've reached out to him trying to get an interview with him. Uh, but yeah, I think this is much bigger than just uh, one guy. But at the same time, like the if you look at the volume in the stock, uh, no way. Really? Nah, that's wrong. Oh, that's for the week. Sorry, for the week, 
we have traded 590 million shares. There are only 300 million shares outstanding. So where are these shares coming from? It's interesting, right? Uh, so I think there's there's an options scenario here. If if the stock play, if the stock closes above a certain price uh, on Friday tomorrow, I think Monday you'll see some more fireworks, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what he does over the weekend. But yeah, still one of the most interesting stories in the entire stock market. Uh, obviously, it's it's a divisive stock. People like to shit all over it. People have called me an idiot for many years, long before Keith Gill was even a person for thinking that GameStop could turn it around. Uh, but yeah. I've been long the stock for a really long time. And I think if you've been long the stock for a while, you're probably up. Uh, I've taken some gains and options and stuff around trading around the position. But no, like I, I didn't sell any shares this week. Maybe I'm an idiot. We'll see. Uh, so yeah, that's that's it. We did it. Those are all the stories. Oh, my God. Um, we got one community note or we got a couple community notes here. Uh, we got a few questions and comments from the Shack News community. So you can either head over to Shack News Chatty or comment on YouTube like this guy did. Uh, Haas Mamu said, I saw Asif break Vampire Survivors. He was using it almost as a screensaver. Add Contra and he'll never leave. I think he's right. I absolutely love it. And I did just kind of have an endless version of the game running. Uh, I think I got to like 900 hours or something stupid. Jeez. Uh, that was a few years ago. I don't know if you guys noticed. I get obsessed with games at time to time. Huh. And then... Uh, I saw you injected I, a shack chat here. Yeah, get out. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, my folks came in, and I might not have been on mute. My apologies. Yeah, that's no problem. It's all good. Uh, but yeah, uh, and then lastly, we wanted to ask which video game character would write the best diss track. And I think TJ, you already answered this, right? I did. TJ said Jamie from Street Fighter Six. Yeah, I said Ice T from Def Jam Fight Forever or Fight for New York. <laughs> that's, that's pretty. Good. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, <laughs> not not. Um, Knuckles, I guess. Not nobody from Sonic. I kind of feel like Sonic would be kind of saucy. Knuckles, I think Knuckles is good. That's not Rec bad. Answer from the Sonic universe is Vex. Yeah, Vex would be good. Vex would make a great diss track. Axeman said Jam? Parappa. A Toe Jam would be good. Yeah, Parappa's yeah, Parappa Parappa smart. Yeah, Parappa. It would be like a Kendrick Lamar heel turn though, because like I never thought Kendrick had this in him, but now, man, <laughs> I. I I did. We knew this. This is a problem. You do not screw with a guy's height and think you're going to get away with it. The guy's from Compton. Also his wife and his kid. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he started with the height and <laughs> went from there. This is a problem. All right. Yeah. But yeah. But my, my thing is, yeah, Toji and Earl, maybe Seaman from the Dreamcast. Back of the day. <laughs> Leonard Nimoy, the narrator of Seaman? No, uh, no. Seaman himself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah. Uh, Joe, do you have one? Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with Batman from, Ar mm. from Arkham. Yeah. Okay. Cause Batman. he could, he could pay, he could pay for the, either the training or the content. If you guys want a preview of this week's Shaq chat, what game do you want to see get a current gen update? Like what mm. just happened with fallout four? I mean, jumping flash. Mm. That is a, I've dated myself and made myself more obscure. So, that's success. Goodbye, everybody. I said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said F Zero X. That'd be lovely. Right? Yeah. And, and that's that has to be your answer. That's that's the the fact the that the Shack Chat in this podcast is largely just a vehicle for me to talk about F Zero. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Awesome. Uh yeah, that's yeah. I don't know, Joe, if you have anything, but if you if you're no, still thinking. I'm good. I think we set a record today. This is this is the longest shack together we've done. Oh my god. Anyway, that's it. We did it. That's going to do we it for today's it. show. Subscribe on your local podcast facility. I don't know. Is there like a warehouse for these now? Yes. Are there physical media podcasts? Uh, yes. These are all pressed to vinyl. You know, I saw someone on Twitter, which means they were an idiot just by default, but they said they didn't know that Steve Jobs invented podcasts. And I was like, he didn't really invent podcasts, but he kind of, yeah. he coined it. Kind of. Not really. He probably stole right. it from someone. But anyway. Shout out to Steve Jobs for inventing podcasts, if he did. But yeah, there was this video, and they're like, I didn't know this. And it's like, shut up. Just dumb <laughs> kids. Didn't even know pod iPods existed. Uh, but yeah, this will go live late Thursday night or Friday morning, depending on when Joe gets to this. And if it is up on Thursday, I will embed it in the Shack News Evening Reading article that goes live tonight. And there'll be another article that goes live tomorrow. It'll be on all your iPod apps and whatever the hell else. Spotify, all those places. Nanos. Right? Yeah. yeah. Get, get your iPod shuffle updated so that you can clip it onto your shirt 
and listen to this podcast. Uh, so yeah, that'll do it. We're done. We did it. Thanks for joining everybody. Uh, this is where we wave at the camera and say bye. And bye. Uh, bye. Thanks, bye. Thanks, Thanks, you. Thank Thanks for you. coming, John. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining TJ. And yeah, we'll see everyone next time. Absolutely. is a Shack News production. Shack Together is a Shack News production. Shack Together is a Shack News production. Production. Shushin. Shack News is a multimedia company consisting of a variety of entertainment properties, including including shacknews.com, video game and cutting edge technology coverage with evergreen video, guide, and long read content, providing readers and viewers with the latest reviews, previews, interviews, and news. Shack News content is readable and viewable at shacknews.com, Facebook, YouTube at Shack News, Shack News Interviews, and Shack News VODs, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram at Shack News Media, Twitch, and more. But that's not all. You can play Bubbletron, our first video game. Combine three ideas, hit the market, and get your money hat. Bubbletron is a daily game in the style of Wordle where players can launch a company and see its valuation instantly. Hit that high score and brag to your friends. Visit Bubbletron.com to play. There is no download required, no signups required, but if you are into app downloads, we have the cutest one on the planet. It's called Shack Pets, the ultimate battle for cuteness. Swipe your pets to victory on iOS and Android in this Tinder-like app for pets. Shack News is proud to present a variety of micro products, all available for free at shacknews.com. Cortex is a publishing platform available to all of our users. Shouts is a Twitter replacement in a time where Twitter really needs replacing. And Reader, an RSS reader that won't get shut down by Google anytime soon. You can import YouTube, subreddits, all sorts of cool stuff, even podcast feeds. And lastly, all of our products are completely free to use and play. So if you're a fan of what we're doing and want to support the Shack News ecosystem, head over to shacknews.com slash Mercury. Mercury offers subscribers access to exclusive Shack News swag like hoodies and VIP access to our long reads uh, in downloadable format. It's a great way to support us. There's different tiers and you get a lightning bolt next to your name. 